Um, so I'm your entertainment for the first hour, um, and uh, we're going to turn the lights off so you go to sleep, do your mail, something else. But uh, uh, how many of you were, were in shell shock uh, the first day or at the end of the first day? Come on, admit it. All right. Good. Uh, the class had some effect on some of you. That was actually the goal by design. And I wanted to kind of talk to you about, about why we designed the class as it is, um, how we got here, and more importantly, kind of celebrate uh, what you've accomplished, because I think uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, I've been uh, watching your slides and looking at your weekly presentations on Launchpad Central. We've basically taken you from a faith-based <laughs> company to a fact-based company in seven weeks. And if you think about what a faith-based organization is, is I'll contend on day one, while you might have had some great insight about your science or technology, uh, the rest of you were, and the rest of your uh, startup was actually a religious activity. Um, <laughs> and, and, and hopefully now, after talking to 50 or 100 customers, uh, you actually have some facts. And when we put together the life science version of this class uh, two years ago, we kind of had a manifesto, for better or worse, I'm going to just share with you what we were thinking. Just three slides. Uh, number one was that the assumption that the pursuit of drugs, diagnostics, devices, and digital health is all about the execution of just the science is a mistake. And of course, we always give it in most cases. Meaning, yes, we understand that's what's exciting. Yes, we understand that that's what puts knowledge and pushes knowledge forward. But that's not the same as turning it into a commercial venture, as you're all kind of discovered. Yes, it's great you figured out a new device or understand a new target for a therapeutic or understand how to solve a healthcare or diagnostic problem, but that by itself is typically not enough to make a profitable and scalable company. Um, second part of the manifesto was we need to use a customer-driven needs approach we call customer development to build a viable business model. And, and again, as you all kind of got, that is the core of the class, is by definition, by definition, it's a given that all of you are the smartest people in your building. And by second definition, we think we've proven that while that might be the case, there's no possible way you're smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential regulators, customers, partners, you know, clinical trial uh, partners, et cetera. And, and I think you discovered that. And the third approach is the whole reason why we were pushing you to do this is our goal was to help you reduce technology risk, regulatory and market risks for all your startups as early in the process as possible, even though the process seemed brutal and hard and whatever, you accomplished more in the last seven weeks than most startups do in the first two years. The sum of this knowledge actually gives you something which we call evidence-based entrepreneurship. Just like we talk about evidence-based medicine, we can now talk about the same class of evidence that you're trying to accrue on freedom to operate, IP, regulatory issues, you know, reimbursement issues, who the customer is, distribution channels, you know, partners, etc. And you all have accumulated a massive amount of evidence. And let me just, when I keep saying you, let me just remind you collectively, at least into the seven weeks up to before today, what the numbers are. In seven weeks, this room spoke to 1,546 customers. Think about that, 1,546 pieces of data. Now, I know some of you were saying, yeah, but they were all idiots, they hated our product. Um, <laughs> but, but that is just an amazing sum of collective knowledge, and you tested 709 hypotheses. Now, I won't tell you that the other piece that I didn't put up there is you found that 380 of them were wrong, uh, but that, in fact, was probably the cheapest way to find out you were wrong now than it is two, three years from now when you've scaled the company. Kind of hired a sales force and found out that's not your channel or not the product or not what your customers or partners or 
not the res you picked the wrong goals for your clinical trials. So we think you've done an amazing, both collectively and individually, amount of work in the last couple of weeks. This class essentially was a clinical trial of your business model. If you think about that, that's what we had you doing. And so over the last uh, two years or so, we've put 83 life science teams, uh, 60 of them uh, uh, from UCSF, through this process. Another 23 went through uh, uh, the NIH version. And we have data on, I think, Stephanie, I think this is from the first uh, UCSF cohort, is about half of them, which is a pretty uh, uh, meaningful number, actually ended up getting funding and turning them into real companies. And so we have evidence here, in the beginning of evidence, uh, that this is kind of interesting, that actually this process does accelerate your ability to actually figure out how to take a science idea and turn it into a commercializable idea. And I think it's kind of time to celebrate. Uh, we've basically, you know, not only got from an idea to a fundable company, but the sum of you are now kind of a movement. And it's made possible by you. And I thought I'd share with you how we got here and, and where we're going. And so I'm going to tell you a little, uh, a little bit of inside baseball about Lean Launchpad and i -Corps and um, what our roles were and how did that end up uh, uh, getting in front of you. So uh, the epiphany I had was after 21 years uh, in the startup world, I did eight startups. Uh, most of them as spear carriers, a couple as kind of executives, uh, one as a CEO. Uh, and when I was the CEO, uh, I uh, raised uh, $35 million for that company and uh, ended up with a crater so deep it has its own iridium layer. Uh, and uh, for those of you non-geologists, somebody could explain it to you. That means I left a smoking crater. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I spent 21 years writing this thing. It was called the business plan. Anybody ever have to write a business plan for anything? Yeah. Um, you know, a business plan, you know, like structured document, VCs required. I kind of think of business plan as at least in the 20th century in Silicon Valley, the document that VCs made you write so they didn't have to read. Um, that's a joke. Some, someone will think about that for a second. But it, it was only um, after I retired and took up photography that I was actually able to capture um, a real photo of what happened when a business plan had first contact with customers. This is an actual photo from the field of what it looks like when a wonderfully structured plan that said, here's what we're going to do, actually met customers. It looks like that. <laughs> This is the Charge of the Light Brigade, by the way. It's basically chaos. And for those of you who ever like, encountered you know, building a plan and then actually launching a company, you find out that plan is obsolete about a nanosecond, maybe even shorter, you know, after it comes off the printer. And you can't print them fast enough. And the other part, and by the way, I, I should tell you, there's a story which actually happened to me is, uh, when I started teaching, um, I had a student come up to me at, for coffee. He said, Professor Blank, I have a real problem. You know, took your class, and then the VCs made me write a plan. And what's the problem? Well, the customers are not behaving like the plan. And I went, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, how can I help? Well, what should I do? And he started taking notes. And I said, well, you know, obviously the thing you need to do is wrap a copy of the plan around each product so the customers will have to read it and know how they should behave. And he started taking notes. <laughs> um, and I finally had to explain, no, that's not what we're going to do. Now, the other part of about a business plan, uh, some of you, anybody ever do a five-year forecast? A five-year forecast on plan? Um, so the other part of the business plan is Appendix A, the five-year forecast. I used to also tell my students uh, that you really didn't need to do this because there was a secret Excel key code to auto-generate $100 million in year five. <laughs> and there are still students from 13 years in my first class at Berkeley who are still trying to figure out what the secret key code is. Um, now, by the way, plans and forecasts, as much as I diss them, make all the sense in the world in an existing corporation when you're launching a second, third, or nth product into a known market, known customers, known whatever. I'm not suggesting we ditch planning. 
But I'm suggesting that the only other people who did five-year plans on what's essentially a series of unknowns, not knowns, but a startup is a set of unknowns, is venture capitalists in the Soviet Union, uh, are the only people to require five-year plans on a series of unknowns. And so this kind of got me thinking, we had this stuff for execution. That is, plans and, and, and spreadsheets made all the sense in the world when we kind of implicitly understood, though we didn't have the word, what our business model was. When we understood our customers and our channels and competitors, planning that, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But when we didn't have a series of knowns, we didn't even have a language, let alone a set of tools to deal with that. And so I kind of said, well, wait a minute, the distinction between a large company with knowns and a startup with a series of commercial unknowns is the distinction between search and execution. And what that means is, is that for me, large companies execute known business models. But all of you on day one, you're searching for business models. I don't mean for your technology. Well, take that as a second for, as a given. But all the commercial things, who my customers are, what's the regulatory path, what's the right reimbursement strategy, who are my partners, all those, you're guessing on day one. And so what I ended up doing is I started reading a lot. It turns out there was a lot of literature on corporate entrepreneurship, but almost no literature. Gordon Bell's book and Jeff Moore's book, that, that was about it. Bill Davidow's book, there's very little literature on you know, how to build a startup, and it all kind of looked like a smaller version of a large company. And so after reading all this stuff at the turn of the century, I came to some, at the time, were some pretty heretical conclusions. Number one is startups are not smaller versions of large companies. What you guys and women are doing is nothing like what's going on in Merck or Pfizer or J&J or Medtronix or take whatever large company eventually you want to be. You're doing nothing like that. Yeah, maybe some of the core science is the same, but how you're building your business is not the same as what a product manager is doing in a large corporation. As I said, large companies execute known business models. They could have nice product planning and product management diagrams. They could have nice forecasts, etc. But you're searching. And by the way, that gets back to day one. On day one, not only are you searching for a business model, you have to believe that you're going to find one. Because startups are driven by the passion and vision of their founders. If anybody's noticed, Accountants don't run startups. It's a big idea. My apologies to any accountants who are looking at it. <laughs> but they don't. This is not a game for accountants. This is a game with people with passion and vision who, in fact, take their hypotheses on day one and rapidly search for whether they're correct or not. And so this kind of got me thinking about, OK, well, what is a startup? Yeah, Steve, it's about search versus execution and blah, blah, blah. But when I was doing startups in the 20th century, if you would have asked me, I would have said, oh, startups is where we get to bring our dog. That's what a startup is. Or no, it's where we get free food. Or no, it's a band of you know, small team that doing something crazy. And, but there really wasn't a good definition. It was some Harvard, anybody remember the Harvard definition of uh, Harvard Business School? you know, with doing something with limited resources beyond your, you know, rational control or something. And, and, and it sounded important, but I still never understood it, even though I used to teach it. And, and I, I realized we needed an actionable definition, one that actually kind of told us what we were supposed to be doing. And so I came up with one which I think is as good as any right now to describe what the nature of the beast is. And to me, a startup, and we'll parse this for a second, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. So number one, the goal of a startup, and I have to tell you, I have to explain this to a lot of people, the goal of a startup is not to be a startup. Right? The goal of a startup is to build something large. If, if the goal is to still be a startup, it's not a startup, it's a hobby. Think about that. 
So it's a temporary organization. That great fun you're having with that you know, crew you're working with and it's a wonderful team and whatever, that's, enjoy it. But if you're successful, that goes away and scales. And the culture will change and everything else, but it's temporary. But it really does have a purpose. Even though you might be world-class clinicians or researchers, etc., while you're trying to make the science better and scale it, you're also searching for something that's repeatable and scalable. And by repeatable, I mean what worked on Monday works on Wednesday, works next week, not just in the lab, but the sales process or the regulatory process or the reimbursement process, all is repeatable. And if we give you an input of $1 or a million dollars or $10 million, we'll get some number that's hopefully larger <laughs> at the other end. That's the scalable part. And we now have something to actually measure. We're looking for something that's a repeatable and scalable business model. We're not just asking for revenue or show me the numbers. We're asking you to actually help, help us understand all the components of your commercialization pathway, not just your science pathway. And, and so I think this is worth keeping in mind of what you've actually been operating with. You're basically a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Now, this was kind of handy because when I went out and talked to my VC friends when I started thinking about entrepreneurship and this idea of uh, search versus execution, um, you know, Silicon Valley and, and you know, South San Francisco kind of the home of some of the most riskiest bets ever in both science and technology. And I was stunned to find out from my VC friends that over 95% of startups, depending on the field, don't fail because the technology fails. That's a huge idea. Turns out that oops, startups fail because they confuse search with execution. Most startups fail because they simply fail to find enough customers or large enough markets, not because your technology didn't make it. That's a huge idea. And that should, in fact, scare the heck out of you. You spent X years in the lab working on wonderful technology, and you just didn't figure out the right business model. Whoa, how frustrating is that? So the idea was, can we reduce risk by building some tools to help us search for business models. And I realized after doing a survey of everything else out there that there really were no good tools that focused on searching for a business model. And so I said, can we build a process to search before we execute? And I said, I think so. So again, I went back and looked at all the literature, um, let, read everything that was out there at the time, and came up with this customer development process that you've actually been you know, executing these last seven weeks, which essentially says, let's get out of the building, take all our hypotheses, um, do some customer discovery, see if we could validate them, assume that, you know, a good number of our hypotheses will be incorrect, um, do some pivots and iterations, and then eventually we get into an execution mode uh, by creating customers and scaling and building a company. And this customer development process basically was built around what you've all been beaten up for for the last seven weeks. There are no facts inside your building about commercialization, so get the heck outside. And so our belief is that if you front end a plan with a customer development process, once you understand your business model, then you could go into product management and what, what kind of development process you want, but we wanted you to do some planning before you actually wrote a plan. Now, about 10, now maybe 12 years ago, I took all of these, at the time, heretical thoughts and put it in a book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, in fact, it wasn't even a book, it was my class notes in the business school at Haas when I um, started teaching it, and one of my students, uh, someone named Eric Reese, who I'll mention in a second, said, hey, you're on the board of Cafe Press, why are you Xeroxing this for your students? Why don't you just kind of self-publish this? And 
a quarter million copies later, um, it kind of started the Lean Startup movement. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I started teaching a class uh, called Customer Development at uh, UC Berkeley and Haas. Uh, I co-taught it, um, which started a pattern you'll see with a venture capitalist, uh, Rob Midalis at Treehouse Ventures. And then um, I had a student who actually uh, really wasn't a student. Berkeley's still trying to figure out how did he get in my class because he wasn't registered at Haas. Um, <laughs> and so I can now actually, there, I think the statute of limitations is over. I had invested in Eric's last two companies and him and his co-founder, uh, Will Harvey, wanted another check. And I said, gee, you guys just lost eight million bucks in your last one. I got this new idea on how to build companies. I'll write you another check, um, but you've got to attend this class. And what would happen is uh, Eric and Will would drive up from Palo Alto, and Will, who now also gets it, would you know, just bitch about, oh, why would, gee, this is the worst thing we ever had to do to just get a damn check. As soon as we could find some real money, we'll just drop Steve's class. And in the meantime, Eric was going, oh my god, he invented anti-gravity. Let's go do this. And Eric was in charge of engineering at the time and became the first practitioner in the world, in the world, and took um, customer development from academic theory into practice. And so Eric, uh, uh, co-founded IMVU, I sat on his board, and Eric's insight, which actually was critical, was, Steve, not only do we need to get out of the building, but my model of how engineering worked in the 20th century, which is waterfall development, that is, you know, you spec the product, you did a, you know, marketing requirements document, you did a functional spec, you did, you know, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, it's how I learned how to build products, was actually at first for software and now almost for everything, just simply not what's done anymore, it was agile engineering. That is, you build products iteratively and incrementally, and Eric's insight was that's the perfect pairing with customer development, is not only as you were getting out of the building should you be talking to customers, but you should be showing them what we called minimum viable products in real time. And you could finally build minimum viable products because you were using an agile engineering methodology. And in fact, Eric named the whole thing, I just called it customer development, Eric actually gave it the name, the Lean Startup. And that turned this into a much better model. We had customer development, and now we had kind of the agile model, which started in software, but the concepts work for almost anything, including, as you uh, hopefully found, not only for the obvious, for, you know, healthcare, IT, and, but also works for devices and diagnostics. And, we discovered for therapeutics as well. You don't need to wait 12 years until you got a phase one trial to actually start talking to the head of research at Merck. And in fact, if you're good at it, and I think you know Todd Morrow and others and oh, uh, everybody else who's been kind of advocating this, is that you could have them teach you what the high quality data set is that you need for clinical trials and get a collaboration within 18 months. And then- Or faster. Or faster. Uh, did you now change it? It used to be 18 months. What's the new number? I think I'm doing nine. Nine, okay. Um, and so um, the last missing piece was this thing called the business model. Uh, after I'd uh, been teaching at Haas, I got invited to also teach at Stanford in the engineering school. And my teaching assistant and I, and Mira Co, uh, started drawing our version of the business model. And then one day, you know, I've been reading about business models, and Anne was a great PhD student at the time, and she was reading about business models, and Anne ran up to me and said, you got to read this great book. And I had just found this great PhD thesis. And I said, no, 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 Anne, before I read your book, you got to read this great thesis about business models. And she, she said, no, 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 you got to read this great book about business models. And we kind of like jokingly argued, and she finally won. She said, Steve, you'll love it. It's all pictures. Um, all right, you're supposed to laugh there, but it, <laughs> it actually is all pictures, right? Business Model Generation is the best book ever because it describes truly what used to be 400-page books and theses and whatever in a single diagram. In the Business Model Canvas, we've summarized in nine boxes on a single slide an incredibly complex idea. Here's like 90-some-odd percent of all the commercialization things you need to be worrying about. And so when I found Osterwalter's book, Anne and I integrated that um, into, uh, into our class. And there he is on the phone right now. Um, and uh, it's the definition of what search is. 
And so what we ended up with was an even better model. That is, we start with our framing our hypotheses on the top with the business model canvas. We use customer and agile development to get out of the building, test those hypotheses, and eventually when we validate them, then we could go write an operating plan and have a financial model. And then for process, again, then we start with customer development and then we'll have something for product managers to go do. And of course, this allowed us to kind of develop something outside the building that looked a lot like the scientific method. And we'll get back to that phrase again. That is, for me, customer development was simply starting with hypotheses, designing experiments, testing, taking the data, getting insights, and modifying the hypotheses. You know, every scientist in the world would go, well, what's new about this? Well, let me tell you, if you've ever been in marketing and sales, this was a mind-shaking concept. You know, it was like nothing that we had ever done. You know, what we had done was wrote plans and kind of attempted to write, to execute to the plan. Um, by the way, uh, how many of you have done a startup before? Anyone? Um, turns out in the 20th century, you're not going to believe this, but I live this. Um, how startups would work is you would write your business plan, summarize it in nine slides, assume you got funded, so let's assume you got N million dollars, board would manage you, buy that spreadsheet you put together under the influence of something, they knew you were kind of faking it, but you kind of knew it too, so, but they made you manage to that spreadsheet. They also made you hire to that spreadsheet. And you would go through alpha tests, beta tests, first customer ship, typically hiring a VP of sales around beta test time or maybe a little earlier, whose their goal was to build a sales force by first customer ship so you could make those revenue numbers. And then what would happen is that the product launch day, if your VP of marketing was good, the first board meeting, everybody would be high-fiving each other. Great launch, look at the press, back then it was mostly print, you know, look at all the ink we got. Ink was stuff we used to smear on dead trees and hand to people. And some of you might not remember those, but your parents could explain to you what a newspaper or magazine looked like, but um, it was kind of, believe it or not, a Kindle on paper. Um, um, <laughs> but, but that was the first board meeting, and no one looked at the VP of sales. Everybody knew what the revenue number was supposed to be, but right now it's zero on that board meeting. And then you'd have board meetings every six weeks, and all of a sudden people would stop paying attention to VP of marketing, and they'd be acting, uh, looking at the VP of sales. And they'd say, how are we doing? And almost inevitably, the VP of sales would say, great pipeline. Now, only some of you are laughing, which means we're not making the numbers, but it's going to be good. Don't worry about it. And by the way, in the meantime, the only number the company is making is the expense number, meaning it's burning all the cash, but it's not bringing in the revenue or progress that it said it was going to make. And depending on the economic climate, assume a non-bubble, um, you know, this would go on for six months, a year, 18 months, until the board got very concerned. And I don't know, I think they go to school for this, but they, at one board meeting, they turn and look at the CEO quizzically, and, in, and they'd synchronize this. All the investors would arch one eyebrow. And that was it. It was just one, I, I can't even do this. Uh, you could tell someone who's a VC, they know how to do this, because the CEO automatically gets the signal that says, fire the VP of sales. Um, and so the next board meeting, you'd walk in the board meeting, and the minute the VP of sales says the word pipeline, it was great. A puff of smoke happens, uh, you know, the stench of death is in the room, pile of ashes, and a new VP of sales shows up who says, that was a stupid strategy. Here's our new strategy. New strategy. Obviously, you know, it was the fault of the VP of sales. By the way, this repeats for nine more months, and if we're still not making the numbers, who gets fired next? Any idea? Of course not. It's the VP of marketing. Um, it can't be a sales problem. We just hired the new VP of sales. It's a positioning problem, right? <laughs> Gordon's laughing because he remembers this, right? It couldn't, right? It wasn't the sale. So we fire another executive. Then finally we might fire the CEO. Then if he owns enough stock, becomes the, you know, head of biz dev or strategy or something um, or chairman of the board. I tell you this long story to make you understand how stupid we were for 30 years. Do you realize that the only way we were allowed to do a pivot in the 20th century was by firing an executive? We never once said, perhaps the plan that we funded was wrong. All of you have had the luxury 
of assuming that the plan on day one is fungible. You've had 100% permission here to assume that all your commercial hypotheses are just that, science experiments. But in the 20th century, that was not even a subject of conversation. The only way we changed strategy was we said it was the fault of an individual. And by the way, a good percentage of the time, it was the fault, but actually the mistake we used to make is hire executives who knew about execution, not about search. Just as an aside, the thing that took me 20 years to understand is while the titles are the same, the job specs are radically different on day one for sales, marketing, and biz dev. You could hire the world's best salesperson out of Johnson & Johnson, Merck, or Pfizer into a startup, and the odds are they will sink like a stone. Not that they've become stupider, but they, because they were world-class execution experts. And on day one, that's the last thing you need in an early stage venture. Sorry for the soliloquy. Uh, so I wrote another book, and then um, Lean Startup, three parts, which are now all kind of executing. Business Model Canvas, Customer Development, Agile Engineering. We all know entrepreneurship is experiential. But up until five years ago, the capstone class, that is the top class you could take about entrepreneurship, at least in business schools, was how to write a business plan. That was it. OK. You know. Yet everybody who was teaching it, was a pra who was a practitioner, knew we were lying to you. We were truly lying to you, because we knew that this plan wouldn't survive, but we didn't know what else to teach. And the problem was the pedagogy, that is the class, was designed by theorists, not practitioners. And again, I just kept coming back to entrepreneurship, at least the stuff I did, it was a lot of pick and shovel work. Yeah, it's theory, but it was a ton of practice. So why don't we teach it that way? And so I started at Stanford taking a radical break from my customer development class and put together the first instance of the class you're taking. It was called Engineering 245, the Lean Launchpad. Um, admission, much, much like you, was by uh, application and by team. You had to fill out a business model canvas, which back then was just radical. Um, I taught it, much as I, I said earlier, with uh, uh, venture capitalists. I tended to do that with uh, uh, every class I did. I had this idea of uh, having a mentor per team, which I think uh, you're still practicing here. Um, and this was a joint engineering and MBA class. Is that, no, I didn't want just all engineers, um, but I certainly didn't want all MBAs because I actually wanted us to actually build something. Um, and, uh, and then I uh, started something uh, called the Startup Tools page on my, uh, uh, on my website. Um, but something happened after I taught that first class. Because I thought this class was so radical. And it really was. It was now we kind of laugh is that you know, this is kind of one, of one of the ways that we teach entrepreneurship across not only the US but the world. But five years ago, this had never existed before. So I said, what the heck? Why don't I open source the class? And so I blogged every class session. I took every, every week's presentation of my lectures and your slides and did a running commentary on my blog. Here's what worked, here's what didn't, here's what the students learned, here's what whatever, and, and put it on the blog. And about six weeks after the class ended, I get a phone call from a guy named Errol Arkelik at the National Science Foundation. And Errol, are you in the room? So Errol kind of like was telling me about, I think his first line is, the US government needs, needs your help, I think was his first <laughs> line. And because I had spent four years in the Air Force during Vietnam, I think the first words out of my mouth was, F no. <laughs> and there's a, right? Was, and then, but then he said, you invented the scientific method for entrepreneurship, and you know, I'm from the National Science Foundation, thinking I'd be impressed. But of course, remember, my, my background was as a marketeer. So I said, what's the National Science Foundation? <laughs> and Errol was sure he had the wrong guy, and even if it was the right guy, it was the wrong guy. Um, but, it, but in fact, we worked as a partnership because for 30 years, the US government had mandated, for those of you, how many of you have or, or know about SBIR, STTR programs? Hopefully all of you. Um, mandated that the 
federal research budget reserves essentially now about 3% of the research budget for commercialization in, in, inside these SBIR and STTR programs, besides basic research. Uh, the government said that. That's the good news. The other good news, at least for the federal agencies, but bad news for the rest of us, is the government never asked for 30 years, so how well are we doing? We essentially were giving out cars without requiring driver's ed. And the returns and the results for commercialization weren't particularly impressive. And the reason why was just the ones that Errol was observing is, you know, we were trying to turn scientists into MBAs, and that was not a particularly efficient way. And so Errol and I partnered, and we turned this into a, a class called the i -Corps. Errol picked the first uh, 25 teams from all seven directorates, Errol, yeah, uh, of, of the NSF. And again, I co-taught this with venture capitalists, and uh, it, admission was by application and team, but this time Errol did the admissions process, and, and I had never heard a guy make a potential Nobel Prize winner cry before, but uh, Errol was, was clearly capable of doing that, and the admission process was even tougher to get into i -Corps than anything I could imagine. VCs were part of the teaching team, mentors were part of the team. Um, now uh, we're, we're north of, we've put north of 500 teams 1,500 team members taught by 50-plus universities. The genius is in, in the i is not only the fact that we, you know, teach teams 25 at a time, just like here, but it, the fact that they scaled it into nodes and sites. Um, you know, Berkeley, UCSF, Stanford, uh, in the Bay Area uh, are some of the nodes in Southern California, USC, UCLA, et cetera, and then just a ton of sites um, all across uh, uh, the United States and uh, uh, just a ton of qualified uh, uh, i -Corps instructors, Carl, Todd, um, I don't know who else is in i -Corps, uh, David, Stephanie, et cetera, um, all have been trained by the Innovation Corps. Um, the good news is, um, you know, they threw me out of teaching it after the first couple of classes. We trained the trainers. The other thing we did, by the way, is invented a way to kind of look over your shoulder. Uh, for better or worse, the Launchpad Central is the only tool that existed to be able to monitor 25 teams. In fact, the first time I taught this, I actually made, you think Launchpad and Central, for those of you who grumble about it, um, <laughs> what I made teams do is start their own WordPress blog. And, and because I wanted to watch their progress, they were all doing WordPress. And my teaching assistant, Bhavik Joshi at the time, said perhaps there's a better way that maybe we could write some software to automate the process. And that's how we ended up with the Launchpad Central is, uh, not only for us, but then for the NSF, is that the teams were spread across the country, and for us to manage and understand what they were doing, we needed some way to do that. Now, at the same time Errol and I are doing this, we find a secret Santa. Um, because, gee, th this was a pretty radical notion, even inside the National Science Foundation. It was an unfunded mandate, et cetera. Um, and so Congressman Dan Lipinski, uh, who I met uh, walking the halls, believe it or not, trying to find somebody in Congress who would be interested, was in the House Appropriate Science Appropriations Committee. And what a coincidence, he went to Stanford in my department. And so I got to meet with uh, Congressman Lipinski, and you know, he nodded in a typical congressman way, you know, looking at his watch, you know. Yeah. And, and, but a week after I meet with him, back at Stanford, I get a call from his chief of staff. Congressman Lipinski uh, wants to know, is your class uh, starting next week? Why, yes it is. Oh, how nice. He actually wasn't only trying to tell the time. Um, well, why? Congressman Lipinski will be attending your class. What? <laughs> Congressman Lipinski, I said, does he need any more credits from Stanford? Is there you know, <laughs> something going on that I missed? Um, and, and so he shows up in the class. Now, only at Stanford, right? This first week, you know, people introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dave, mechanical engineering. Hi, I'm Sally from biodesign. Hi, I'm Dan, congressman from Illinois. Why well, at Stanford does no one like pay attention? You know, like, there's a congressman in the class. I mean, that's okay. They were sitting with Chelsea Clinton in the next class. It didn't, didn't matter. So he sits in the class. We go to dinner, and he says, "This is going to work." I said, "Yeah, I think so." He, he said, "Well, do you think so?" Or do you? I said, "I know so. It will absolutely work." He said, "Don't embarrass me." And, and the next thing I know, the NSF mandate gets funded, and I didn't bother to tell the NSF for three years is that's how they got their money. Um, but he's been our key supporter on the Hill. The other key supporter is in the White House, um, Tom Khalil, 
um, who was at Berkeley, uh, now runs innovation entrepreneurship for the United States. And uh, Tom heard about this and had the same reaction. Started, sat through a couple of classes at, at Berkeley and said, this is great for the country. And so Tom has been helping us kind of push this um, through other agencies besides the NSF, the NIH, DOE, and a couple of uh, entities inside the DOD are now practicing the same class you're talking. So we train trainers, that is, instead of me just having to teach 500 teams, um, Errol and I and others uh, taught uh, Georgia Tech and University of Michigan uh, as the first two uh, classes, and then we added more schools, and then we put my lectures online. By the way, there are now 275,000 people who have seen those same damn <laughs> videos that you have. Um, I get stopped in airports in like, and people speak to me in foreign languages, and, and I couldn't figure out why somebody was like talking to me in Arabic, thinking I was fluent. And then when I said, I gave them the typical, uh, I don't know, they went, oh, your Arabic was perfect in those videos. We, <laughs> and then I realized that someone had bootlegged the videos in multiple languages and like have translated these same Udacity videos. Um, we now train educators. We train uh, over 200 uh, educators a year on the Lean Launchpad educators class. The class that you're taking now has gone from zero to 160 colleges and universities worldwide in four years, four years. It's kind of replaced the how to write a business plan as a capstone class. But the real story here today is actually about you. You know, we've gone from NSF i into from a single cohort to now multiple cohorts to now a domain-specific cohort to now the UCSF life sciences class. And the Lean Launchpad for Life Sciences was first prototyped here, you know, right at UCSF, driven by Stephanie, who chased me for years. And I kept saying, no, 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 this won't work. And, and Stephanie said, well, perhaps, Steve, you ought to get out of the building. Because <laughs> I said, no, it won't work. And she said, Steve, the name over our building says possibly we know a little more. And so she introduced me to Todd Merrill and Carl Handelsman and, and uh, Abbas Gupta and, and others uh, in uh, and Alan May in, in uh, uh, medical devices who all kind of looked at me like, are you out of your mind? This would be perfect for what venture capital needs to reduce early stage risk. And so we realized that for life sciences, this was even more important. That all you guys, and I mean you guys meaning your predecessors, were bringing to investors technology evidence but no commercialization evidence and that the current thinking about translational medicine, even from the NIH, was, look, we'll use outside consultants and we'll kind of surround the scientists and clinicians with all these resources. And then, you know, once we write up this great document, we'll kind of license or do a startup. Um, but actually, uh, we had some great sponsors inside the NIH who observed that technology commercialization had two components, the science but also the business model and that commercialization, even at NIH, was focusing on number one, but this really requires the team to do both. And so what we realized was, yes, of course, you need to push the science forward, but we needed to also push the commercialization forward, and it needed to be done not by consultants, not by proxies, but at first by the founding team. And so that was our insight. Um, and so our commercialization strategy was essentially to find clinical utility now before spending millions, understand core customers in the sales and marketing process for initial clinical sales and downstream commercialization, assess IP and regulatory risk, and gather data early for customer partnerships and collaborations, um, and identify financing vehicles before you need them rather than later. Um, you know, one of the things we used to do was lie through our teeth to you on day one. We'd say, you know, we're not going to challenge any of your biological and clinical hypotheses. We're not, that's not us, you go with that. And we were lying because we knew we weren't going to challenge them, but the minute you got out of the building, the people who you respected were going to challenge them. And so, of course, your clinical and biological hypotheses were going to change for some of you, but it wasn't going to be for us, it was going to be by your peers. Um, and this new data uh, will affect your um, hypotheses. Um, these slides I got from Carl, who I still think um, are, are valid, 
Um, you know, the, the myths were, you know, findings in preclinical uh, pre research are not often reproducible, um, but we could get some data to address the key development criteria. Um, that G, the myth about therapeutics, is the idea is key and better ideas create value. Uh, what we really want is a clear path to modifying a disease. And that, you know, there's a funding gap. Um, and so that must be a failure of the market. Um, well, we actually want to teach you how to put together an operating plan that justifies investment. And so the real gap is the expertise, at least certainly in therapeutics, to move the early stage research towards industrial relevance. Those of you in therapeutics have gotten that. Those of you in devices have gotten that. Diagnostics have gotten that. And digital health has gotten that. So let me close with what's just next. Um, uh, some of you might know the i -Corps program was basically started by taking the academics and labs pre-company formation. This is where the federal government funds about $60 billion a year. There are about 1,000 teams potentially that could go into this pipeline. And this was the intent of the original i -Corps, is before an SBIR funding um, uh, milestone, train teams so they can actually, you know, put together their phase one grant intelligently. Just one last story is uh, in the middle of the program, when we first started, I think we got to about 150 teams. And all of a sudden, I started hearing some noise uh, from the NSF, I don't know if it was from Errol or others, that says, don't worry, Congress won't be calling you. That's not something you want to hear. You know, it's like, I'm from the government, and I want to help you or something. It's, what's going on? Don't worry about it. Well, that's something else you don't want to hear from the US government. Well, what, what happened? Well, what happened was, for the first 150 teams, the percentage that used to get phase one grants for 30 years, that is the percentage acceptance for phase one grants for 30 years in the NSF averaged about 11%. All of a sudden, there was now a batch of teams who happened to go through this thing called i -Corps that were getting phase one grants 68% of the time. Someone said, there must be someone's thumb on the scale, someone's game in the system. Turns out, not at all. Turns out NSF is, is for those of you who know the process, is double blind, the gold standard of review. Just that for the first time, they were now reading phase one grants that didn't like sound like babble about companies and commercialization and whatever. And all of a sudden, these looked like very fundable um, deals. By the way, they now kind of raise the bar of what they expect because now we take our phase one teams in the uh, NSF and now offer what we call i -Corps Light for i -Corps phase one teams. And uh, that's now offered uh, for uh, everyone who has a phase one grant. And it turns out they're phase two for SBIR. And it turns out that there's a lot of things we could be teaching phase two teams very different than just business model is how to build a sales team, how to commercialize, how to get additional follow-on financing, um, how to scale the company, how to deal with culture. Um, and we can actually open this up to additional state and local teams. And so we're proposing and talking about something called i -Corps Next. So I just wanted to give you a feel of what you're part of and, and uh, what you've been doing in context and uh, what the rest of the program looks like. And um, I, I think while this might have been exhausting, um, it might have been sometimes even brutal, um, you have accomplished more in the last seven or eight weeks than I think most teams do in years. And I seriously mean that in years. Go talk to your peers about what you now know versus what they know after spending millions of dollars. A and um, looking at your presentations uh, that I've uh, seen ready to go up this morning, uh, it's, you have all done an incredible job. So thank you very much for the time and uh, uh, best of luck.